Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I think I look a little bit blue. I'm not sure why I've got a blue filter on here. Um, not quite sure how that looks. Hope that's OK. Oh, wait a minute. Now it's becoming less blue. I think my shirt is making me blue. I'm now playing with my camera while we get started. Hey, look at that. Now it figures it out. OK, I'll just not move, and then everything will be OK. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dealing with the Out of Control Engineer and Dealing with the Out of Control Blue Camera. Uh, this is the Squirrel Squadron event for this week, uh, and it's one that's listener demanded. So uh, I'm appearing by, uh, by popular request here, uh, and I'm going to need some help with that. I'll explain that in a moment. So we'll give everybody a minute or two to appear and get going. But uh, while we're doing that, I will mention a couple of things. First of all, uh, this is on a recording. So if you're watching on the recording, uh, welcome as well. Uh, you on the recording, you can't ask questions. The, the people who are here can. So uh, uh, if uh, people are, are here and they have to go or anything like that, you can watch the recording of this event or you want to share it with your friends uh, on all the places you're watching now, YouTube, LinkedIn. I think we're somewhere else. Uh, I always forget where, where this appears, but um, probably on TikTok. Who knows? But wherever you are, uh, you can watch this uh, uh, again or share it with others. And if you're here, you can ask me questions. And I can see all the comments and everything that comes in. And I really need you to do that today. So uh, on, sometimes on these live events, I have a whole agenda, and I've thought it up, and I've been itching to talk about the topic for a long time. Now, this is a, a favorite topic of mine. It comes up all the time. I have uh, founders and CEOs and investors phoning me up saying, oh, my god, this team is out of control. This person, we don't know what to do with them. Uh, how, how can we uh, make this work? So I'm getting this request all the time. But I hadn't thought of it as an event. Uh, and then several different people in the Squirrel Squadron said, Squirrel, you got to talk about this. This is happening to us. We have this problem. This is really important. And, and we had some really great contributions on the forum, which I'll talk about in a second. So if you're out there and, and you're not on a recording, please make a comment because I need you to help me. I didn't have any particular examples. I didn't have a motivation for this one like I usually do. So I need to hear from you. What brought you here? What makes you interested in this topic? Uh, what examples do you have? Uh, and uh, please put that in the comments. Now, I have a few examples I've managed to come up with myself, but I'm not as sure. Why did you in the community say, this is really burning for us. We really need this. So uh, you got to help me out here so it's most relevant to you. Uh, if nobody puts anything in the comments, that's OK, because uh, I'll just go on and talk about stuff that in is interesting and entertaining to me. But, but I think it'll be a little less useful to you. So uh, please tell me uh, in the comments. Uh, I will see them here, and I will uh, uh, do my very best to reply to them. Uh, now, uh, Laura is going to help us out with uh, a few things uh, to promote the squadron. She's figured out some magic, and she's going to do it here on the screen for us. Uh, so I'll just tell you very briefly that uh, we have events like this every week, and you should see a few of these uh, appearing below my face. There they are. Look at that. Uh, just like I'm a news reader, I should say, you know, aliens have just landed on the uh, at number 10 Downing Street, uh, you know, President Trump has just grown a new head. I, I don't know. I should be reading out the, the news while this uh, scrolls. But uh, what I want to tell you about is the Squirrel Squadron. That's my community of tech and non-tech people working together and learning from each other. Uh, and we have a forum where people are making comments all the time. And we have a couple good examples. If you're interested in those topics, head on over to squirrelsquadron.com. And you'll see there uh, how to join the forum. And, and we'd love to see you on there. Uh, and then we have events like this every week, and there's a couple of them coming up soon uh, listed on the screen. I think one we forgot to put up there is that I'm going to be live in London, so I don't always appear on the screen. Sometimes I actually, I'm a real human. I actually three-dimensional, you know, all, all the uh, legs and arms and everything, uh, and I'm going to appear in front of you. Uh, I think it's the 18th of April. Check squirrelsquadron.com, uh, but I'll be live in London. Uh, talking about tech as a foreign language, and in Belgium in early June, and uh, we're discussing Stockholm and Boston and, and a bunch of other places as well. So a chance to see me in person and uh, argue with me uh, as much as you like there. So uh, one more reminder. Oh, I'm turning blue again. We'll see if I can adjust that. Um, uh, one more reminder to uh, make sure to uh, make your comments here, ask questions, argue with me, uh, bring things up uh, that you're interested in. Uh, because this will be a better conversation if you do that. If you don't, I'll still have fun, and I'm sure I'll give you some uh, provocative ideas. 
please do share uh, what brought you here and, and what made you interested in this particular topic. Uh, thanks, Nora, for the, the Chiron. I don't, I think that's what you call that nifty thing. And uh, she's taking it away. It's magic. Uh, Laura, our community manager, makes uh, all kinds of magic happen in the Squirtle Squadron. Okay, good stuff. So let me start with a story. That's always the best way to start. Um, so I was working in a, a, a client who had um, really got off track. They uh, hadn't figured out what their priorities were. The tech team was um, working on many different projects, none of which seemed to be turning into customer value. And um, there was a, a situation where there was some data scientists. So a lot of you are in this kind of situation these days where you have some people who are kind of academically minded doing amazing work that didn't seem to be turning into value for, for real users uh, and, and serving the purpose that the company was set up to, to, to follow. So uh, a classic kind of problem. I see these all day, every day, worked with hundreds of companies like this. So I knew what to do. And I came in and I appointed someone to be in charge of product decisions, uh, really empowered that person. We had a whole session. We decided what, what the team would work on. We decided what the negative space was. This is a term from art history um, and art criticism. Uh, it's the, the bit that isn't what you're looking at. So the negative space around me is this area behind me, my beautiful house. Uh, but it's not the positive space, right? You're, I hope you're paying attention to me and not trying to count the beams in the ceiling. So we figured out what the team was not going to do. We figured out what it was going to do. We got tickets and assignments and everybody working. And this is pre-pandemic, so we're all in one office. And I come into this little cramped office in Shoreditch. And I sit down and I watch the team working. I think, wow, this is going so great. And then one guy stands up. And I, I can't remember his name, actually. I think it was Matt. So we're going to call him Matt. And, and Matt stood up and said, everybody, forget what you were doing. It's Fix It Wednesday. And he then declared that we were going to work on a whole bunch of uh, specific things that he had listed out, which were nothing to do with what we had carefully prioritized, what the customer valued, uh, where um, uh, where the, the, the company really needed to go. And um, needless to say, this was not very well received, especially by me. Uh, and, and I could see sort of where some of the problems had come from is that uh, uh, Matt was uh, quite an irrepressible character. You've probably met people like Matt who um, uh, act impetuously, who are uh, full of energy and verve and vigor, but totally unpredictable. Um, and guess what? Uh, Matt was not working at that company uh, for more than a few more days. Uh, and and it, needless to say, it was not Fix It Wednesday. We, we vetoed that very quickly. Uh, so that's an example of a really out of control engineer. We'd put in place a bunch of controls. The, the problem was the whole team was um, out of alignment, not going the right direction. Uh, we got everybody kind of pointed the right way. We put somebody in the driving seat. We're steering. We're headed the right way. And somebody says, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to grab the wheel. We're, we're, we're going to head this other direction. Uh, so I hope that's what you mean by an out of control engineer. Now we have uh, Clinton who's commented, uh, an engineer that does not follow approved change control or four eyes process. I think I know what that means. Uh, I'll explain it in a second as I understand it. Clinton, you, were, you correct me. And it's an emergency, so they just do what they think is the right thing to do. Fantastic. So that's kind of a mini Matt situation. Now, Matt came along. It wasn't an emergency. It was just Wednesday that Matt had woken up on the side of the bed that meant he was going to create some chaos that day. And he just said, uh, it's fix it Wednesday. We're going to fix all these bugs that I, Matt, think are important. And, and go around all the processes. So that's similar to what Clinton is describing. Uh, now, by the way, I'm going to ask you to, to do some visual aids with me. Um, and uh, my method of doing visual aids is um, uh, going to be highly uh, audience dependent. You're, you're going to get to do some work. So if you don't have a pen and some paper, uh, you might want to grab that. I'm going to grab mine. Uh, so I've got something uh, here to, to briefly illustrate for you. Uh, so I'm going to fit Matt and Clinton's very helpful example. Uh, into a, a, a little framework. But rather than try to do screen sharing and fancy stuff, I leave the fancy stuff to Laura. She's much better at that than I am. Uh, so uh, I may just do some uh, uh, audience participation where you're going to describe the framework. So, so get ready, pen and paper. Uh, uh, and uh, by the way, if you're driving, don't do this. Watch the recording later. <laughs> Make your drawing later. I, I have had a couple people get into accidents trying to uh, text me or, or interact with me in their cars, which always makes me worried. OK, good. Clinton, fantastic example. Thank you. Uh, what you've got is someone there who is um, uh, 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 acting independently outside the normal controls 
and, and going around those controls, uh, uh, avoiding what uh, you'd normally expect, uh, uh, avoiding the processes you've put in place, like four eyes. I think four eyes is that um, every piece of code has to go through the developer's eyes, one, two. This is assuming you have one eye, uh, known one-eyed developers in your team. You, you might have that. That's, that gets more complicated. Assuming everybody has two eyes, you got one developer with their two eyes, and then another person, maybe their manager, maybe another person, another team, a senior engineer, uh, that person does a code review. And you have to make sure you get at least four eyes on every line of code. Let, Clinton, correct me if I've got that wrong for the, uh, the definition. And guess what? That's a good idea because individual humans can kind of fool themselves and trick themselves into thinking they've written good code and they haven't. So uh, what Clinton's describing is somebody who, like Matt, goes around the processes. Um, but in, in their case, there's a little bit of an excuse. It's not just they woke up on the wrong side of the bed. This person says, oh, there's an emergency. Uh, there's there's uh, some re uh, really good reason why I'm going around the processes. Uh, Clinton says, correct, a, a stronger quality gate. Fantastic. Thank you, Clinton. So um, uh, let me try to fit that into a, uh, a bit of a model for you. Um, and then I'm going to give you some more examples and stories and, and uh, things from, from those uh, cases. Uh, we got some really good responses on the forum from folks who wanted to uh, uh, tell me their stories, uh, just like Clinton has. So I'm going to uh, bring those in as well. So um, if you're working along with us at home, ah, now we'll come in. The camera is camera's feeling funny today. Um, but uh, uh, draw me one of these. Uh, I'm a consultant, so uh, you know it's uh, sort of ob obligatory that I draw two by two matrices occasionally. Uh, I'm filling, fulfilling my uh, professional obligations here. So uh, draw yourself one of these, and, uh, if you can, or imagine it if you'd rather do that. Um, and what I'm going to do is fill that in a bit for you. So um, on the top, uh, I'm going to put. Uh, I have terrible handwriting too. Sorry. Uh, collaboration. Collaboration. Collaboration, yeah, I spelled it right. Okay, and uh, disruption, right? So those are the two at the top, right? And then uh, on the left, I'm going to put um, uh, accountable and unaccountable. Well, I'm going to abbreviate unaccountable because I ran out of space. You can tell we spare no expense here. Uh, if, if you want to pay me to come and give a keynote speech for you, I promise I will make a beautiful slide. You guys are getting this for free, so you get to do some uh, some uh, individual de design. If you're better at design than me, you're very welcome to send me a, a better version. Right, everybody got this? OK. So uh, then what I want to do is fill in what fits in all four categories, because um, you can have people who are uh, accountable but still disruptive. Or you can have people who are collaborative, they're working with others, but they're unaccountable. And we'll fit Clinton's example and we'll fit Matt into this uh, picture as well as others. So um, if somebody is collaborative, in other words, work really well with others, they're interacting with the people in the development team and outside the development team well, um, and they're accountable. In other words, they are giving an account. Now I wanna go on a very short um, uh, tangent here. Sometimes people talk about being held to account, or I'm going to hold somebody accountable. You hear this in politics, right? I'm going to hold the, the, uh, this party accountable for their misspending on uh, defense or on uh, uh, border control or whatever it is. You know, They're doing the wrong thing. We're going to hold them to account, which means vote for me, don't vote for the other guy, right? And the problem in business, when you say I'm going to hold people to account, is that everybody dives under their desk. It puts everyone on the defensive because if I say I'm going to hold you to account, it's your problem. You are accountable. I want to know what you're doing. If it's coming from me to you with a lot of pointing, you're going to scare people off. And that unfortunately doesn't produce greater control. It's a way of, of tightening. Uh, it threatens people and it actually makes them go around the processes. So I, I don't think Clinton is doing this, but if Clinton were to come along and say, you are all accountable. If any of you do not put four eyes on every line of production code, you're going to be in so much trouble. You will not. You'll end up pointing his finger and blasting and, and giving them, uh, you know, what for? If he did that, a lot of people would say, "My God, I don't want Clinton to find out anything." Boy, just don't show him the code, right? Let's run away. <laughs> let's let's do the code separately. Let's build it over here, and then we'll put it live. Uh, they're going to find ways to go around it because they're scared of Clinton, and that's not going to be helpful. Now, I'm sure Clinton does not do that. Uh, but what I'm uh, recommending you do is you stop talking about holding someone accountable because that's what you hear. At least that's what I hear and, and what I observe in others. 
what I talk about is rendering an account. And, and that means uh, 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 going to someone actively, um, that is the person who's doing the activity, comes to someone like you who might be the leader or the executive and says, here's what's happened. This part went well, this part didn't go well, I need more resources here, I need more training here, I screwed up here and I know what I did and I'm going to fix it tomorrow. That's an account. And that's the person giving you an account. And that's much, much more effective because it puts the control in their shoes. Now, of course, you have the opportunity to say, I'm not happy with this account. Uh, you said that they, you thought there was a really good reason for skipping the four eyes process. Let me tell you, that wasn't a good reason. Here are the good reasons. There's only two of them, this one and that one. And outside those, the rule is we don't do that. So next time you give me an account, I want to hear about uh, how you use the four eyes process, except here and here. So. Uh, that would be a much more effective way of having accountability. But in the chart, when I'm talking about accountable or unaccountable, I mean, is, is the person actually doing that? Is the person um, being accountable to someone for business results? Now, sometimes someone is uh, very accountable, but they give you an account based on very technical or um, individual results. So I had, I had somebody being accountable yesterday, uh, and she was being accountable by saying, uh, you know, uh, the, the problem is over here. Um, I have these problems in my team. I'm telling you about them. I, I want you to go and fix them, Squirrel, and I want you to go and fix them by firing that guy. Uh, a very political position, and she told me a lot of uh, scuttlebutt about that other person, which was irrelevant. Uh, so it was not actually helpful. She, what she could have done is talk to me about uh, how the, the problems in her team were related to problems elsewhere, and those had impacts on customers. That I would have been very responsive to, and I could have come up with a solution with her, which might have meant firing the other guy. I don't know. But uh, when she presented them in a very personalized, very uh, political way, it didn't help me. When engineers come and say, you know, this is the best practice. Spotify does it this way. Uh, this is how Facebook does it. Um, we, we, we really need to have greater security here. Cybersecurity is important. And so we need to stop all our work for customer results. And we need to um, beef up our password protocol. When engineers say that, they're not very convincing. <laughs> and I help engineers to work very hard on presenting in terms of customer results. And that's what I mean by accountability. OK, big tangent. Apologies. But I hope that made sense. I'm asking here, is the person being accountable? And are they being accountable in business terms, reducing cost, increasing profit, um, uh, opening new markets, that kind of thing? And if they're able to be accountable in that way, and they're collaborative. So you remember, our uh, back to our diagram. Sorry, I went on a big tangent. So we're uh, up here, I hope I can point appropriately. Yeah, up here. Um, in that quadrant, uh, you've got a productive developer, right? You've got somebody who's a, a member of your development team who's really productive for customers. So that, that's the quadrant we'd like to be in. This, this uh, uh, event is all about the other three quadrants. <laughs> what do we do about people in those categories? So I'll focus on that. Um, but we have someone, now I can never tell um, quite what the, uh, um, uh, <laughs> what the, uh, uh, name is uh, from YouTube. So Digisyc, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right at all, um, but this person says, I might be the Matt in the story. Excellent. Uh, well, I'd really like to help you. Wants to do better without feeling like my ideas and concerns don't matter. Very important. I like that. Uh, can get flowed into the process of everything else. So I, I think what this person is saying, not sure I completely followed, but I think you're saying, hey, I, I sometimes do this. I might behave in a way that is uh, less productive um, and I'd like to do better. Uh, and I'd like to be part of the process rather than um, being kind of stuck out here doing my own thing. Sounds fantastic. And, and I really respect you for um, uh, accepting that maybe there are some things you could improve and that there are some things that uh, your ideas and contributions are, are really valuable. Uh, I, I find it so helpful when people within the team tell me things that I don't otherwise know, help me discover the things and be accountable myself for results that are matter that matter to customers. So. Uh, Jigis Psych, hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, let, let's see if we can work together on some ways to improve further, but I'm really glad you brought it up. So let me carry on with my little chart here and let's see if we, it'll help us to place, uh, to place everybody. Um, so uh, let's move on to the upper right now. So you're accountable, that is you're describing what your results are in business terms. You're uh, responsible for moving yourself in the right direction, helping the company achieve its goals, but you're disruptive. What's happening is that instead of uh, kind of moving along with the rest of the business, helping other people to come along with you, you're you're throwing a spanner in the works. You're um, confusing things. You're causing uh, disruption to the team, and uh, the results you might be getting are are um, uh, maybe maybe a good outcome that you're aiming for, but the way you're getting there is throwing people off, confusing others. Um, and so if you're in that category, 
uh, than you would be. Uh, I just want to remind myself, you are enabled. Now, this might be surprising. Um, and what I mean by enabled is uh, somebody's allowing this person to be disruptive. Yeah, they're accountable. They're saying, hey, look, I'm trying to get to the right result. I'm, I'm doing what I can, but but actually I'm, I'm mixing things up. I'm headed in a direction that's not helpful, and I probably don't know about it. So that's one where I would point to the manager of that person and say, hey, we have to stop enabling this. We have to stop saying to Matt, for example, it's okay uh, that you're uh, mixing up the team, you're changing the processes, that you're doing that unilaterally. Uh, that's a management problem. It's also a Matt problem. We wish Matt didn't do that, but I'm much more concerned about Matt's manager. How is it that Matt got the impression that this kind of disruption is okay? Because some disruption actually is really productive. It's really helpful if it's accountable, if we're sure that we're headed in the right direction. Um, and what we're not doing is controlling that disruption and making sure it's headed in the right direction. I'm going to point to the manager there. Um, now, how about if somebody is unaccountable? So in other words, they might not be heading the right direction. They're not giving a, a, a reason for the changes that they're making. They're not express, expressing why they're uh, taking the software in the direction they're taking it. Um, but they are highly collaborative. Um, so that is, and I have a really good example of that, um, that is an infection. Now, it's not necessarily a poisonous infection. So this is the case where um, you're, you might be headed in the wrong direction. You might be headed away from where the, the business needs to go, where the profit, uh, profitable direction is. But you're working really well with other people. This is quite dangerous because, in fact, you may be taking the business in a direction. You might be headed toward expansion into a new country. You might be headed toward um, uh, uh, a new type of market that the rest of the business isn't coming along with and that isn't going to be the most successful. But you're headed that way anyway, and you're very convincing. You're helping other people to understand this is a great idea. Um, you're uh, leading the troops. You're leading the charge in the new direction. And, and you're likely to infect other people with your bad idea, with your idea that is uh, poorly backed, poorly uh, justified. And uh, so if you're infected in that way, it might infect other people. So uh, this one I, I really worry about. And the, the place where I see this happen the most um, is in cases where you're building a little what's called a skunk works. That's S-K-U-N-K, -K, like the smelly animal, and then works, like works hard. Um, but those two together mean a, a group of people who are working kind of away from the main body, who are working away from the main development team, and, and they're building up some new thing. Well, they're actually a source of infection. <laughs> they're going to be causing a lot of trouble for the rest of the organization, typically, um, when you, you set up a skunk works in that way. Um, the uh, classic example of this is uh, that IBM found that their, their internal processes were so limiting, that their way of building software was so rigid and, and so uh, set in its ways that they actually couldn't build the IBM PC until they actually sent it across the country. So they took the development team that was working on the IBM PC away from all the mainframe frame builders and folks in, in upstate New York where IBM was headquartered, and they sent them all off to Florida. Well, Florida is a nice place to be, so that seemed to work out well for them. But also they isolated them from the rest of the organization, and they intentionally created more disruption. They intentionally were not accountable for their spending and their initiatives and so on um, at the cadence that IBM was used to. IBM used to have great control. Um, you know, they, they would uh, restrict how much food you could buy for the software development team. You know, you couldn't buy too many pizzas. Um, and, and so they moved away from all that restriction which had been kind of come in, in place because IBM had gotten so big. Uh, and they were able to be more creative and more innovative and actually get the IBM PC done because previous teams had not been able to. Now, that's a case where a Skunk Works was really productive. The problem with a Skunk Works, um, as um, uh, Steve O uh, brought it up in the forum, is, is one where, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> nobody has authorized this. So uh, we're, not, we're really getting off the, off the reservation, off the, the piste, and we're, we're skiing down the mountain where, where there might be trees right in front of us. Nothing is keeping us accountable and keeping us on track and making sure we're building the right thing. And when we get into that lower left quadrant where uh, there's great collaboration, people are working together really well, convincing each other they're on the right track, but they're not being accountable. So nobody's checking. You're actually uh, building the software that the customer needs. You're going to be able to sell it. That's when you've got an infectious situation. And uh, I, I use that term intentionally to get your attention, uh, because if you're infected, act quickly. You know, chop off the affected limb, uh, take some uh, uh, vigorous penicillin, you know, do what you need to do to get rid of that infection. If you set up a skunk works on purpose, 
that can be very beneficial as with the IBM PC. But where one kind of crops up because the team gets excited about something, they go off to build it, they're spending customers' money without being accountable, and that never ends well. Okay, so that's the lower left. Now, I want to come to the final one, which is the, the bottom right. So this is one where you're both very disruptive and you're not being accountable. You can imagine this is a, a very toxic mix. So I want you to write in the lower right, uh, you, you've got a nuclear uh, explosion on your hands uh, because uh, where I have seen highly disruptive people uh, who are also unaccountable, uh, you, you get real disasters uh, at investor level, right? You start getting boards of directors involved because somebody wastes a huge amount of money building a piece of software that nobody wants. And I cannot count to you for you in, in the 300 organizations that I've worked in, in in the past eight, nine years, how many times I have seen huge organizations waste millions and millions uh, and, and tens of millions of dollars or pounds or, or um, whatever currency you're using because they are completely unaccountable. There's nothing reining them in and keeping them on track and saying, we have to head this way. This is the software we want to build. This is the product we want to build. There's nothing keeping them on track. And they're disrupting themselves all the time. Instead of at least staying on track and, and being rather uh, predictable and understandable and, and having a good account of what they're doing, they're wandering all over the place because they're always disrupting themselves. They're trying new stuff. Innovation, experimentation, disruption is all fantastic if you're accountable. You start being unaccountable and you get into a real big trouble in a big hurry. And I've had multiple organizations in which they have had to fire the entire development team, uh, in which the whole organization has had to shift direction or go under. Um, thankfully, that hasn't happened to me too many times. I've usually been able to get in front of it. But sometimes the infection has spread too far. Um, so there's a nice little uh, uh, typology for you. So uh, I hope you can work on placing yourself uh, there. Uh, Clinton uh, uh, gave us an example of the engineer who doesn't follow change control. So that's somebody who's being unaccountable. Uh, Clinton, you weren't describing someone who's being very disruptive. This person isn't producing surprising things, not standing up and saying it's fix it Wednesday. Uh, but this person is uh, producing um, uh, results that may not be on the right track, right? Not following the processes um, isn't accountable for uh, the results you'd expect. So uh, I put this person that you're describing, Clinton, in the bottom left. Uh, which means you have an unaccountable person who's collaborative um, and uh, is um, uh, uh, therefore an infection. So Clinton, I'm worried about the person you've got there. Now we could debate whether, you know, which quadrant we should put them in. We're not going to put them in the upper left, right? This person is uh, causing some problems for us. Um, now, Digisyke says, um, hey, I might be the mat in this story. I might be the person who's creating the disruption. What could I do to be better? Um, well, I would try to move in one of the directions. I'm not sure quite where you fit, uh, Digisyke. Uh, it could be that um, you're a more disruptive person. You're actually pretty good on accountability. Or it could be you have a lot of trouble with accountability, understanding what the business is doing, business strategy and stuff like that isn't your scene. Whichever way you are, I would try to move closer to the upper left from where you are. So, um, uh, And feel free to fill in more details. To just like I'd be happy to give you more details and also call you your real name, <laughs> whatever it might be. But um, uh, uh, what you might say is, look, I I'm quite disruptive. Uh, and I'd like to be more collaborative, but I'm kind of okay on accountability. Uh, if that's the case, then you might look for ways to uh, put yourself in, in the situation where you have to collaborate. Uh, look for tools. Uh, these are things like the trust conversation that I talk a lot, test, uh, talk a lot about, test-driven development for people, joint design. Uh, happy to talk more about those if, if you have specific questions. Or go have a look on the forum. There's lots of writing there, lots of material on, on those techniques. Using those to increase your collaboration would really help to move you kind of over to the left on the chart. Or you might say, hey, look, well, I'm, I'm pretty good on collaborating with people. I can get people to follow me. I can get ideas and you know uh, work on them together. But man, business direction, I don't really understand that so well. Then you might start moving yourself upward. You might try to move toward greater accountability and business understanding. So uh, that might mean hanging out with some salespeople, talking more with um, uh, engineer or with um, uh, sales folks uh, and, and marketers and understanding what's important to them, what issues they have, what's holding them back, maybe they need better sales demos, uh, and you could help them develop those. So if you can move yourself, uh, whether you're moving right to left or uh, bottom to top, uh, if you can move your close, yourself closer to that upper left productive quadrant, uh, I think you'd be in good shape. So uh, I hope that's helpful for, for helping the, the folks who, who identified themselves. I missed one, by the way, which is Stefan on the forum suggested that uh, there, was, there was somebody he knows 
uh, who's really an ideas person. Uh, now, I want to look up uh, Stefan's comment because I want to make sure I describe it correctly. He had some really good uh, language for it. Uh, let me find it. That was here. And yeah, so there was a person who, who sees themselves as special. You know, I have great ideas. I'm the genius here. I have the, the super duper notions um, and therefore doesn't really respect other people. It doesn't say, hey, your ideas are also valuable. I want to listen to you. I want to make sure we come up with some solutions together. We're all committed to. This person says, rides roughshod over others' ideas. Says, you know, I'm the idea guy. I know how this works. And, and uh, you know, I use a Mac and all of you use Azure. Uh, so you should conform to me. You should change how you work and put all your code on Macintosh computers instead of uh, Windows because it'll make life better for me. Um, that uh, uh, level of very low collaboration um, it, it indicates this person is uh, being very disruptive. So uh, I'd put this person in the um, uh, high disruption, uh, low accountability uh, category, which would be um, uh, this person is quite a dangerous uh, person, might be a, a nuclear result if you continue with this person being disruptive and saying, uh, hey, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to take into account what you have to say. Not very non-collaborative, but also not accountable. So uh, Stefan, as you described, this ideas guy, uh, sounds like this person is um, uh, uh, both not collaborating and not accountable. So I'm very worried about this one, Stefan. Uh, talk to me more about this. Let me help you uh, to see what we can do to work around uh, the, uh, the challenges you've described here. But I think there's significant hope here. Somebody who has really great ideas may not be so great at listening to others, but may be really helpful at um, uh, generating um, uh, food for thought, right? So with the right help, uh, this person may generate really good ideas for discussion. They may just need some help in moving away from the unaccountable row of the diagram to the accountable row and learning how to give an account, how to describe results in business terms uh, is a really good way to move from the bottom row to the top. We can talk more about that if it's helpful. Good, all right, so uh, more questions, more examples. Uh, I have some more for you, but I wanna make sure to pause for, for questions from you and, and scenarios from you since this all came from you guys. You said, I wanna talk about these examples. What more do you have for me? I'll give you a few moments. Clinton, how am I doing on uh, categorizing your example? Stefan or uh, Steve, Owen, uh, Steve O, I'm not sure if you're here, but um, uh, if you are, I'd love to hear how I'm doing on your, on your examples. Give you guys a few moments and maybe you have more typing to do. Um, if that's true, I have a couple more examples and some cautionary tales. Uh, so let me go into those. The first is it's easy to mistake somebody who's in one of these four categories or really the three we're worried about somebody who's being enabled to be disruptive and, and uh, accountable, uh, somebody who's collaborating really well and unaccountable and therefore is uh, sort of an infection and sort of spreading around, or somebody's got that nuclear ca ca the position, they're, they're both disruptive and unaccountable and they're blowing things up every direction. There are people who look like they're in those categories and they really aren't. And one of them that to really watch out for uh, is people who have a different level of mental health uh, so something is going on with their health, or they're just diverse. They're just really different in their thinking. Um, so a couple examples of those are um, people who are really depressed. Uh, and I've uh, coached some folks who are uh, really just uh, not functioning well, not looking at the world realistically. And guess what? Their morale is low. Uh, they're difficult to be around. They're disruptive because um, they're, uh, you know, they're uh, negative on the code that they're having you review. They're negative on... Um, uh, their interactions and their delivery to customers. Uh, and, and so somebody like that can look very disruptive, can look very unaccountable, but in fact, they have a health condition. So um, be very cautious about making judgments based on where people might be in these categories. Um, but the categories are very helpful for discovering that. And in a couple of cases, I've seen people who looked really burnt out, who were uh, disruptive and, and uh, low morale and not helping. But the reason was there's was something chemically happening in their brain. Once we were able to discover that and help, that person was a really productive team member. So uh, watch out for mental health disguising itself as um, uh, uh, team collaboration problems there, and look for signs of mental health difficulties. You don't have to be a, a therapist. You don't have to be a, a clinician to discover those. Um, your, your senses are pretty good at it. And there are tools you can use, uh, very simple diagnostic tools that tell you get a professional's opinion here, this person can be helped 
Um, I remember one person um, uh, who uh, just stopped answering his phone. <laughs> it was COVID times. Uh, people were working from home and we just couldn't raise this person. And we got quite worried. Actually, uh, the CEO sent the police to his house and the police knocked on the door and said, are you OK? And he said, no, I'm not OK. And guess what? We got him some help. Uh, and that was really important to do. Uh, this person wasn't being disruptive or um, uh, obstructionist. This person was just ill uh, and, and we needed to help him. So watch out for those. Uh, that's cases where someone can look like an out of control engineer, really is out of control, but for a really good reason uh, that we need to help them with. Uh, there's another case, which is uh, some people just really think differently. And, and this particularly affects engineers. I have said for a long time with no clinical basis for it, I'm certainly not a, a therapist, uh, or someone who's an expert in psychology. Uh, but I will tell you from experience with hundreds of uh, uh, software development organizations and, and thousands upon thousands, probably tens of thousands now of engineers I've met, if you're gonna work with computers, you need to be somewhere on the spectrum, i.e. Uh, the spectrum of people who are all the way uh, autistic to Asperger's to uh, just a, a, a little bit neuro neurodiverse and thinking differently. The reason is very simple. Computers are the most autistic things on the planet. Right? They, they only think very rigidly, uh, they're unable to uh, read signals, they can't do more than one thing at a time, they have all kinds of characteristics that fit great with the kind of thinking that um, people on that spectrum tend to have. So if you, you kind of force yourself to think that way in order to debug computer programs, otherwise you really can't do it. So that's my um, uh, completely unfounded uh, therapeutic uh, psychological theory. Uh, but what I will point out to you is that there are people who just think differently and um, you can make them productive. You have to act differently, you have to take into account that uh, someone may have a different approach to the world, may have a different way of thinking, uh, but they can be tremendously productive for you uh, if you take into account some of their, their particular behaviors and their ways of thinking that are, are different. They, they aren't ne negative or positive, uh, they're just different. Uh, so I uh, can go on about that a bit more if you'd like, but, but I just wanted to draw this distinction between uh, this is someone who's sitting in one of these quadrants that's not so productive, not so helpful for, for me and my team. And, and boy, how could I get rid of this person? This person's a problem. I'd encourage you not to think that way. I'd encourage you to say, uh, look, uh, this person is uh, obstructing something for me, is, is keeping my team from being accountable. Uh, and what could I do to support that? What could I do to change that uh, so this person could be productive for my team and thinking differently? You may not get there. Uh, there are certainly people, uh, you know, I didn't keep Matt around because Matt was very disruptive. <laughs> Matt was destroying the team. Uh, and no matter how Matt thought, he wasn't gonna work with that team. Uh, but it, it, there are certainly cases where someone has a, a different way of thinking that's really valuable, that really helps you to debug problems and uh, work with certain types of customers and so on, um, but needs a little help in dealing with customers, in uh, helping out marketing or working with people outside the technology organization in a different way. So I'll just put in my little advert there for uh, mental health is super important. You got a, t a duty of care to people in your team um, and diversity is also valuable. Okay, so we have some great comments here. Let's have a look at those. Uh, Clinton says, fantastic. LinkedIn user says, uh, familiar with from this book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. <laughs> All right, um, this is one where I can't see who you are. LinkedIn's annoying this way. So hi, whoever you are. Um, but uh, it's very funny that you should mention that. Uh, because the book I wrote uh, with my friend Jeffrey Frederick, uh, Agile Conversations here, is based on everything that's wrong with Lencioni's book. So <laughs> we took it apart and we said, uh, hey, we're really frustrated with um, uh, five dysfunctions of a team, Jeffrey and I, because um, we find that uh, the, the book doesn't give you enough solutions, doesn't give you enough to do. So I'm not going to go on a long tangent with this, but yes, absolutely, anonymous person, uh, this was an inspiration for a lot of the ideas that we talk about. It's certainly valuable to look out for these types of dysfunctions. The problem with the book is it doesn't tell you what to do. So I tell you what to do. And you can keep coming to my events and you can ask me lots of questions. You can get the book or ask me to send you a copy. I'm not trying to sell you one. But, but we wrote our book specifically to respond to the five dysfunctions, which is why there are kind of five key chapters and techniques in our book to respond to each of Lencioni's five. So entertaining, you picked that up, you kind of reverse engineered that out of our book. I hope that was enjoyable. It's certainly uh, entertaining for me and I hope helpful to you. Uh, Stefan says, uh, I had an example last year. This is the one I think he wrote about on the forum. Thanks Stefan for, for bringing that up. Uh, offered them the engage opportunity to engage and be less disruptive, opted to leave instead. Not a bad outcome, uh, seemed to be the best result. I wonder if there was something we could have done to help him be less disruptive. Unfortunate, he had some personal issues. We would have liked to engage with him to allow for this. So Stefan, I'll say a couple of things about first about this. First of all, sometimes you just can't um, help a person to operate differently. They're they're operating in a disruptive way. 
in a different environment, they may be less disruptive. Um, in a, uh, a different part, point in their lives, they may be less disruptive, but, but typically you can't wait for that. So I don't think your story has a, a tragic ending. Um, uh, I don't think this person is um, uh, un unsavable, but I also think that that's a, a tremendous effort to get them to, to be less disruptive. And I'm sure knowing you, Stefan, that you, you did a bunch of things to try to help this person to be more productive. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, Stefan says, is there anything that can be done if someone point blank refuses to stop disrupting meetings? Uh, and, and other people are laughing at that uh, out of recognition, I think it's kind of tragic laughter there, which is uh, certainly mine. So, uh, Stefan, you're describing Matt from my initial story, uh, who, who was someone who just um, was disrupting uh, all the processes of the team, not just the meetings, and, and couldn't stop and really couldn't uh, operate in a different way. He, he needed to be in a much smaller team with um, uh, much less uh, developed processes, um, really a cowboy Wild West, um, um, uh, very early stage development team, and he would function well there. Uh, and I believe that's what he went off to do, and, and that was better for him. Now that might be the case with your engineer. It might be the, that the engineer has other stuff going on. Refer to my mental health comments. That could be an issue for this person, or it could be just that the 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 team doesn't fit this person as well. And, and so the one thing I'd encourage you to do is to uh, have a trust conversation with this person. Understand why they're disrupting the organization. They may not know. Uh, they may not see it as disruptive. They might say, "Oh, look, you know, we're trying to get the best practices here. You're not listening to me about what the best thing to do is." This is my concept of betterism. Um, which is very damaging to keep saying something is better. Uh, but um, uh, I would give that a one shot and see if you can understand that. And, and to be fair, I had done that with Matt earlier in this in the story when he'd been disruptive before. And I could tell that Matt just didn't see this as a problem. He didn't observe that uh, his disruption was causing any difficulty. He thought he was saving the team and, and really helping. And I couldn't um, uh, use his language uh, to, to, to move closer to him. But sometimes he can. And Stefan, I'd encourage you to, uh, if this happens to you again in future, have that trust conversation. Uh, it's it's um, uh, test-driven development for people is the, the fancy title for it. I can say more about it if you want. It's in chapter three of the book. Um, try to get your understanding of their reasoning first, if they can share it with you. And if they can't, don't wait. Um, the, uh, don't uh, spend tremendous amounts of effort trying to understand why somebody is being that disruptive. Do it once, and if you can't figure it out, really, you're not going to be able to do much. Uh, you, you need people who uh, who are going to, to work with the rest of the team, who are going to be accountable for customer results. Okay, Stefan, I hope that was helpful. Um, oh, it's Paul Davey is the anonymous person. Excellent. Hi, Paul. Nice to see you here. And uh, glad you're <laughs> glad you're enjoying five dysfunctions. Uh, if you read Agile Conversations, you'll feel, see it, it. It fits right in. Good stuff. So um, uh, let me close with uh, one more story. Now, if there are more questions, Stefan's example was fantastic. Uh, Clinton had a really good one. I'd love, and Digipsych, I hope I was uh, uh, giving you something helpful. Please give me more here and uh, I, I will um, uh, very happily discuss them. Uh, oh, we have one from Craig. Uh, one of the best and most informative live streams on managing teams. Mo so much useful information. Craig's an old friend. Excellent. Thanks for saying nice things, Craig. I really appreciate that. If you have any stories of a disruptive engineer, uh, or out of control person, feel free to tell me. Uh, here, here's a hint. I think you might have been in some of the teams that had some of these experiences. So um, uh, from, from uh, previous uh, places where I've worked and, and coached. Um, Stefan says uh, what, what he, I was saying resonated with his experience. Good to hear that. Any more stories, any more questions are very welcome, but let me go to a, a final one from me, which is another example where somebody um, really had good reasoning. And by having that trust conversation, by having the, uh, the patience to understand, I was able to bring this person back from being disruptive. Um, and, and it also has some funny elements to it as well. So uh, this one particular engineer now, uh, I think I'm going to call him Bob. Um, uh, uh, I do know who this was. I don't remember Matt's real name, but I do remember this guy. But uh, we'll call him Bob. Bob um, had some options in a startup that I was uh, uh, working in. And um, uh, Bob was a very impractical sort of person. Very, very good with anything to do with a computer. Practical things uh, like uh, matching his clothes or remembering to wear socks. These were not things that Bob was so good at. Uh, whether Bob was somewhere in the spectrum, I don't know. I didn't measure him or get a diagnosis, but but Bob definitely was um, more academic, ethereal, um, you know, thinking about software much more than Bob was thinking about practical things, which you'll see uh, that really affected Bob's disruption. It really is what led to uh, uh, the disruptive behavior. 
At one point, um, the CEO was describing some changes to the options and um, uh, was describing how the strike price of the options was changing and um, how some other things were being adjusted and was describing quite a good result for the, for the employees. Uh, and one of the things that was happening was that the strike price was remaining low. Uh, and if you know anything about options, the strike price is what you buy your options at, and then you immediately sell them for a whole lot more than that. So you would like your strike price to be low so you can buy low and then sell high immediately. And so the difference between these two is what you get if the company eventually sells, which this company did eventually. And, and um, Bob and others got to exercise their options and they got a nice difference between those two things. So uh, we were explaining this and we were explaining how it was changing. It was actually changing in Bob's favor and everyone's favor. Bob did not understand this. Bob was really confused. And, and Bob became very disruptive in the meeting and was stomping and stamping and telling, well, you guys are screwing us. You're making everything terrible. You're horrible. This is, you fooled me. You uh, cheated me. And it was really disruptive, really bad for morale. You know, here we are giving this good news and, and Bob's uh, ranting and raving. And, and so I had to just kind of pull him out of the meeting <laughs> and figure out why on earth is this guy being disruptive? Now, the, the contrast with the Matt situation is there was a really good reason <laughs> for Bob's um, uh, disruption and for his confusion and, and his anger. And uh, I was really glad that I took the time to find out what he was angry about. It turns out he, he had a fundamental misunderstanding. It was probably we didn't describe it very well. And he also wasn't a financial wizard. He, he was this more um, software um, academic kind of thinker. Uh, and so he had confused the value of his options and the strike price of the options. You know, I was saying before here in a, in a more calm and clear way than, than obviously got across to Bob. Uh, that you want the strike price to be low, the sale price to be high, and you get the difference. He had the impression that his price was down here <laughs> and that we were making it lower. And he said, my God, I didn't realize they were worth this small amount. And you just told me you're making them worth less. You're cheating me. This is terrible. And you could understand once you got past um, his thinking, once I got to the point where I understood how he had come to his conclusion, it was pretty easy to undo that and say, hang on, Bob, could I just tell you there, there's something you've misunderstood. I've described it badly. Could, could we talk about that? Once he understood that we were making the difference bigger by making the smaller number lower, uh, uh, he, he felt very differently and that ended the disruption. So there, there can be really good reasons why somebody is disruptive, why someone's angry, why someone's being unaccountable, um, and it's worth listening to those. And I really learned that uh, with Bob because it would have been easy to just uh, escort Bob out of the building. <laughs> he was really uh, um, um, very unhappy and, and expressing it in an unproductive way. But once I saw it from his point of view, it was very uh, helpful to, to understand where that came from. So that's my cautionary tale to you. So um, you guys asked me to talk about out of control engineers. Um, I, I gave you a kind of typology of them, which I hope you all have on your on your nice uh, two by two diagram that you drew. Thank you for drawing my uh, my visual aids for, for me. Um, uh, and uh, you might have somebody who's accountable and collaborative and therefore uh, is productive, not an out of control engineer. You might have somebody who's disruptive, but still accountable. Um, and that person's being enabled. You got, you got a problem with the manager there. You're, you're enabling that person to behave that way. Um, and no one is, is acting on the accountability. Um, you, you might have somebody who's collaborative and unaccountable. Um, and that's an infection because they're, they're, they're really good. They're using their unaccountability to, to infect other people with ideas that are not um, uh, productive for the business. You got to get stamp on that one right away. Um, and you might have the worst case, uh, which is like our friend Matt, uh, somebody who's disruptive and unaccountable. Um, but there are other actions, as the story of Bob illustrates, um, that nuclear case uh, may actually have some really good reasons. It could be mental health issues, it could be um, uh, diverse thinking, or it could be as simple as somebody who doesn't understand how a strike price works. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily, I've called it a nuclear case, it's because I want to get your attention. It's not because the person needs to be nu <laughs> nuked. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, take action on this one right away. you got a ticking time bomb there. So uh, I hope that's helpful. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed talking to you about these topics. Um, we're going to continue on the forum. So I uh, would love to see you over at squirrelsquadron.com. Uh, I'll stick that in the comments here and, and stick it up on the screen. So uh, head on over there. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen me before, if you're not a member of the squadron, please join there. Uh, you get a uh, um, it, my insanely profitable tech newsletter every morning with uh, provocative, or sorry, every Monday, uh, once a week, um, with uh, provocative ideas, new things that I'm learning, uh, uh, new notions like the ones we've been talking about here. 
uh, you get uh, to be a member of the forum and discuss these topics and, and ask questions uh, just as you've been doing here. Uh, and you can come to loads more of these events. Uh, and uh, like I say, next week, uh, our topic is uh, stop being data driven. Uh, I think that's going to be really, uh, again, quite provocative. Um, some new ideas, uh, some people are telling me all the time that they want to be data driven. And, and I think they're missing something. I think if you use data all the time, sometimes you make up the data and it really misleads you. So uh, join me next week for that. You can find all the details about this and other things uh, that I've been talking about on squirrelsquadron.com. And thanks for being with me today. Have a fantastic day.